Hi, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Emergency Planning for Arts Nonprofits, led by Steve Eberhardt of Performing Arts Readiness. My name is Hope Cagle, and I'm the Education Manager and Accessibility Officer at Arts Fairfax. I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair, and I'm wearing a navy shirt. My background is teal and has the Arts Fairfax logo. Um, before we get started, as Lisa asked before, please rename yourself with your organization and your pronouns. Um, be sure to keep yourself muted, and you can enter questions in the Q&A and unmute yourself before we pause when we pause for questions. Um, we'll be recording this webinar and it will be posted on our website. Um, even though we're virtual today, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Arts Fairfax is located on the traditional lands of the Manahoac Nation, and we pay our respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. The land was stolen by English explorers in the 1600s, and because of raids by Iroquois tribes and infectious disease from European contact, the last remaining Manahoac people likely joined the neighboring Monacan tribe. And Lisa is going to introduce Arts Fairfax. Thank you, Hope. Here is our Arts Fairfax team. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to meet all of the staff. We had have a really great team on board and have had a lot of transitions as many organizations have over the past year and look forward to um, working with you all. So um, some of the staff is also online today. Um, and we'll be joining in the, the questions and the discussions. Let's go ahead to the next slide. I'm just gonna give a really brief introduction to Arts Fairfax. Um, we are the designated local arts agency for Fairfax County. Uh, over the past year, we went through a strategic planning process and our new mission statement is that Arts Fairfax is dedicated to expanding support for and access to the arts and culture opportunities for all of Fairfax County. And we do this through community engagement. We have an arts director and events calendar a robust artist residency program, which is being expanded um, this year through the Fairfax Poet Laureate. And we currently have a call out for the second Poet Laureate. The application is open until the end of July. So if you are a poet or you know any poets that are based in Fairfax County, please encourage them to take a look at this opportunity and apply. And we're also working on the Fairfax County Master Arts Plan. We have um, finished up the facilities plan. It's in the final approval stages with the county and are starting on the Master Arts Plan for Public Art. Um, we also have a grant program, as many of you know, and are uh, recipients of our grants. Um, we'll be announcing the operating support grants next month, and the project support grant application is open now until the uh, first week of August. Um, this is part of our professional development program of workshops, the um, emergency planning workshop um, that we're conducting today and on July 28th um, is one of many offerings that we have planned for you for FY23. Um, and we're looking forward to rolling out additional um, opportunities that are gonna be starting in the fall on business models for the arts, um, some marketing focused programming, and these will be in service of both arts organizations and individual artists. Um, the annual arts awards event is going to be coming up again in October so be looking for your invitations and more information on that and we also are in the process of working with Americans for the Arts on the Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 so thank you so much for your support of this important advocacy tool so that in a nutshell is what we do and um, we welcome your feedback. Um, we also um, have 
regularly scheduled community conversations. And in the meantime, you should feel free to reach out to me or any of the other staff members if there's anything that you need help with. And um, in, I'm going to turn it back to Hope now to introduce our um, facilitator for today. And thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we are really excited to be working with Performing Arts Readiness again to provide this two-part webinar. Um, emergency planning is something that every organization needs to do. Um, and you might have noticed that recent grant applications are asking if you have a plan. Um, so these workshops are designed to help you create or update your plan um, to be in compliance with best practices. I would like to introduce Steve Eberhardt with Performing Arts Readiness. Steve is the project coordinator for Performing Arts Readiness and has coordinated collaborative grant funded projects at Lyricist for 20 years. His most recent project provided training grants sorry, consultations to preserve photographic and audiovisual collections at historically Black colleges and universities. Emergencies, disasters, and catastrophic events can have a devastating impact on performing arts and visual arts nonprofit organizations. So we're happy to be working with Performing Arts Readiness to provide this. Um, don't forget the second part of the webinar is in two weeks on July 28th from 2 to 3.30. Um, and then Steve, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, just some reminders. The next workshop is the 28th. Um, the Fairfax Poet Laureate application deadline is the 30th. Um, we have our grant final reports due for FY22 on August 1st. And then on August 5th is the project support grant application deadline. All right, thank you so much, Steve. I'm gonna let you take, take it away. Great, thank you so much. And uh, thank you everyone for um, joining us today for introduction to emergency preparedness for performing arts organizations as presented by the Performing Arts Readiness Project. And um, before we uh, get started, I'm just wondering if you could put in the chat box what type of organization you represent. I know that um, there was a variety of types um, I saw that had uh, registered. I see Choral Ensemble. I know there was, I think, a Performing Arts um, Center as well. Um, there was quite a variety in another choral group. Excellent. Someone is an educator. Well, great. Uh, thank you so much, a local arts agency. Great. And um, I'm going to turn my uh, camera off for the uh, bulk of the session now to preserve bandwidth. And I see we have a ballet and contemporary dance organization represented as well. Um, before we um, dive into a broader discussion of emergency preparedness, um, we I should mention the impact of the pandemic. Um, it's still with us um, and we uh, see occasional surges in cases and uh, COVID-19 uh, has profoundly affected uh, arts and cultural heritage organizations, um, operations, and they've uh, brought to light the importance of emergency planning. And those organizations um, who had emergency preparedness plans in place before 2020 were ahead of the game. And emergency plan should identify the priority tasks and follow up to be performed by all staff. And um, this would assist organizations as they prepare to close their doors and reopen. Um, an emergency plan should have developed crisis communications messaging for all of your stakeholders needs and this would help um, organizations contact their staff performers audiences and vendors about uh, canceled or modified events and a plan b should be identified that uh, provides alternative or additional activities with uh, minimal resources and the pandemic is just one of a wide uh, variety of other disasters over the past several years, which have caused damage to many types of uh, arts and cultural organizations. Um, on this slide, uh, we have listed uh, hurricanes, flooding, wildfires, uh, mass shootings, 
cyber attacks and extreme heat. Um, the um, we've had some recent uh, horrific mass shootings in the US that um, demonstrate our vulnerabilities uh, and the uh, difficulty in preparing for um, such attacks. And the uh, PAR project does have a webinar called Event Preparedness, um, Active Shooters and Hostile Activity at Your Venues that addresses issues around this. And uh, there is a recording of the uh, June 8th session of that uh, webinar on our website. And we want to talk to you about how you can uh, create uh, coordinated and effective responses to crises and disasters and create resilience in your organizations um, that can mean the difference between survival or closing your doors. Um, since we just looked at the uh, types of disasters that can happen to a performing arts organization, um, let's just look uh, very briefly at the terrible tragedy that uh, happened last November at the Astro World uh, Festival concert in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, 10 people died and more than 300 people um, were injured when the crowd of attendees surged toward the stage. And following the incident, um, our colleagues at the Event Safety Alliance published a web page um, that examined uh, some of the possible contributing issues, such as um, security staffing, uh, how many security people were near the stage, uh, were the staff prepared um, to spread out elsewhere around the event, um, crowd management training. Um, were the organizers trained about crowd dynamics? Uh, what were they prepared to do to keep the crowd safe? Um, barricades. Um, what was the barricade configuration at the front of the stage? Um, were there barricades arranged so that they would not fall over and, um, and also set the, so that they could provide an aisle for security to see into the crowd? Um, there are, uh, the ongoing investigations did reveal many security issues, such as minimal exits, lack of signage, poor lighting, and communication issues. And the link to the full safety, uh, Event Safety Alliance webpage um, will be on a PDF handout of these slides that uh, you will receive. Um, but looking at um, just such a tragedy as that, we see that uh, some planning um, and preparation could have addressed the issues that led to the tragedy. Um, and using the chat box, um, please uh, let us know if your organization has experienced any emergencies and what the impact has been. Um, what type of emergencies uh, have you experienced? It could be something like a leaky pipe or and you lost records, or it could be a flood and lost the whole building, or you uh, could have lost a funder at a critical time. Um, my colleague um, on this project, Jan, who will be presenting uh, the webinar in a couple of weeks, did have a car crash completely into her orchestra office in an historic building uh, where she was meeting uh, with her accountant. And luckily, they were both sitting on the opposite side of the room, but the room did fill with uh, smoke and exhaust fumes and um, the incident occurred several weeks before performance, but it caused a ripple effect of chaos that uh, did last for months um, into the following season. And does your institution have a disaster plan? Um, please put in the uh, chat box a, a Y or an N to let us know if you do already have a disaster plan. Um, our project partner, uh, the National Performance Network, conducted a survey that revealed that a majority of performing arts organizations did not have disaster or continuity of business plans. And many stated that uh, planning was not a priority and many were unaware of the need for planning and they did not have time or expertise to plan. And these findings were a part of the reason that the Performing Arts Readiness Project was uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation. And I see uh, Linda has indicated there that uh, her organization does not have a disaster plan in place.
And in this next session, section, um, we'll be talking about some of the basic considerations for emergency preparedness. And I will be covering a lot of information very quickly. Um, so this webinar is just a brief introduction to this area. Um, I will refer to um, other webinars that go much deeper into um, other areas. And I see Tanya indicated that they do um, have a partial plan in effect. So the goal of emergency management is to mitigate damage and resume operations as quickly as possible. Um, historically, we've used the term emergency planning. Um, records managers and businesses may use the term business continuity planning, and government agencies often refer to the same efforts as continuity of operations planning. And the goal is the same to mitigate damage and resume operations as quickly as possible. And most of the literature does take a phased approach to emergency management and is displayed on this graphic. Mitigation or prevention are steps taken to prevent disasters from occurring. And this is done through risk assessment and management. And these activities will reduce the probability of loss. And preparedness is the positioning of an organization's resources um, before an emergency occurs. Response are, is the um, activities established to react immediately and effectively to an emergency. And recovery um, are the activities associated with restoring resources and resuming normal operations following a disaster. And let's now look at uh, the most common causes of disasters. Um, disasters related to heat and fire threaten all of our organizations. Fires are the result of human and natural causes. Uh, water and wind related disasters are the most common overall. In the Southeast um, where I am, um, our organizations are vulnerable to a host of weather related natural disasters, um, hurricanes in particular. The further north you go, the higher your chances are of dealing with the blizzard. And in uh, recent years, we have seen the vulnerabilities of the West Coast to wildfires. And um, now we are um, all still in the midst of a global pandemic. But um, disasters are not just naturally occurring. Um, anyone who's had a power failure or who has had their uh, server crash knows of the disasters that technology can cause on the functioning of our institutions. Um, also, if uh, we're located next to an airport, a major highway or uh, train tracks, we have to be aware of potential hazards from chemical spills or major accidents. We've always had to deal with a possibility of vandals damaging our building. And now we um, should um, consider things such as civil disasters or uh, uh, terrorism. And we need to think of our plans as all hazard plans. An organization that has planned to respond to all phases of a disaster will respond more effectively than one that is not prepared. The planning process itself is valuable for all staff as a learning experience. Um, without a plan, people may react unpredictably to a disaster. Um, we can make mistakes due to insufficient or incorrect information. Emergency management is a vital tool in reducing this initial shock of a negative event. Planning will aid in mitigating damage. It will help ensure the quick resumption of operations, um, and it will improve safety conditions and security practices in an organization. Um, it will help control chaos and reduce problems, as well as reduce insurance costs. Um, and it will also aid in the compliance with laws and policies. And this should answer the question of why you should prepare for a disaster. Moving on, we need to ask, what are the goals of an up-to-date emergency management plan? An up-to-date plan will aid in identifying and protecting your organization's assets, priority materials, and vital records. And this is gonna be different for every institution. A useful exercise might be to ask your staff if they could save one thing, what would it be? Getting the answers from various departments and positions 
should provide you with a better picture um, of the organization. Um, reducing the risk of disaster. Prevention is the cheapest and most effective disaster response. Um, it improves your capability to resume operations after a disaster. Having a well-conceived plan should help you get up and running faster. Um, it increases your ability to recover damaged or lost assets. Um, this is especially important for any unique or rare materials, such as an orchestra's library of music, uh, theatrical posters, costumes, sets, or props. And these are the objectives of a disaster plan. Think of using them as a mission for a planning committee or as part of a job description of the staff member tasked with emergency preparedness. Disaster planning is a process of gathering information, analyzing processes, and developing a plan of action. It's a working document that should be tested and revised. Um, here are some of the most uh, common components of a comprehensive emergency plan that um, start with the uh, introduction. And that includes the purpose, author, organization, a schedule for updates, and the date revised, uh, evacuation plans for staff, performers, and the audience, your communications plan. And that should include staff contact information and other emergency contacts. Um, it also includes your emergency procedures, and those are specific procedures for responding to a variety of emergencies, including fire, bomb threat, power outage, um, medical, um, or weather issues, uh, including um, building evacuation. Um, your plan uh, should also include the uh, facilities plans with uh, floor plans that show details like shuttle valves and breaker boxes, uh, maintenance schedules, your fire detection and security systems, and uh, any um, hazardous material storage that you might have. The goal there is to reduce surprises. Uh, resource lists should also be included. Um, they should have information about outside emergency personnel, including uh, police, fire, utilities, hospitals, um, as well as um, electricians, um, elevator companies, and carpet cleaners. And your insurance information and expedite your authorization information should include detailed procedures. Your general response procedures should be included as well. And this is the response team function and responsibilities, supplies list, um, and instructions on how to salvage specific types of materials. Um, we do have 12 sample emergency plans available for download on the PAR website, and I do encourage you to look at a few of these and perhaps use them as models for your organization. Emergency management is more than just protecting your assets, although that's a critical element. Um, it's also about resuming operations and minimizing loss. The performing arts community can look more closely at the allied field of business continuity planning. And the goals are similar, but in some cases, business continuity does take a more practical approach to the resumption of operations. And we should consider the organization-wide impact of a disaster because critical functions such as payroll will still have to go out. A business continuity plan uh, pinpoints resources, actions, tasks, and data required to manage disaster prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery in the event of a business interruption. Some arts specific examples of critical records include uh, donor databases, uh, single and season ticket purchase information, and uh, production documentation. Um, plans must include and provide for all formats uh, that an organization may hold since digital and paper files do have different needs. Um, once you've identified the critical functions and services of your organization and the resources required to support them, you can prioritize the order of processes to recover them. 
And increasingly, um, vital records are in an electronic form only, and they must be protected from damage and potential loss. Um, organizations should consider a combination of methods for protecting electronic vital records based on their format, um, available resources, and uh, environmental and security requirements. The basic methods of uh, protecting vital records is through duplication, dispersal, and protective storage, whether on-site or off-site. Um, dispersal is the uh, planned distribution of copies of records and information to off-site locations, other than where the originals are housed. Um, protective uh, on-site storage includes the use of fire-resistant and environmentally controlled storage vaults, um, and make sure the data on individual workstations gets backed up on the institution's server. Offsite storage uh, was thought only suitable for uh, low use uh, records um, in the past, but now we do need to think of it as the host of your electronic records. If you're using offsite hosting, um, you need to be aware of any potential problems and um, access advantages that this can provide. Um, we've talked about the types of disasters and the phases of emergency management. Traditional emergency planning has focused on preparing for and recovering from isolated emergencies and disasters, but uh, recent regional disasters um, demonstrate that this approach is not sufficient for dealing with a disaster that paralyzes an entire area or region. Um, recent publications on disaster preparedness do emphasize varying the response according to the severity of a disaster. The Field Guide for Emergency Response, um, a document that was written for cultural heritage organizations, but is good for all organizations, recommends classifying disasters as minor, major, or catastrophic. A minor incident is the most common type of emergency facing a performing arts organization. A localized leak from pipes, appearance of mold, or test problems can occur at any time. In this case, regular operations may be interrupted only in the affected areas of the facility. As these incidents may be isolated to a small area, the Cleanup can be handled by regular staff, but they may have to be pulled from other departments. Um, there may be some um, interruptions to operations, but an institution should be able to continue most operations. Outside services may need be needed to uh, remedy the problem that caused the incident, such as a plumber to fix pipes or maintenance to repair the roof. Response to a minor incident um, should be fairly straightforward, provided that an institution does have a plan in place. Uh, start out by following procedures outlined in your disaster plan. If it's a minor incident, you can use stockpiled supplies in your disaster supply kits. Provide authority to your um, disaster team to respond appropriately. And that may mean the authority to close off parts of your building to your audience. Um, and I wanna ask um, all of you, um, if you know um, who has the authority to make that call at your organization, um, because it will be difficult to make decisions like that during an emergency. And be sure to document the incident using photos or videos. And this will be useful for future training and for your insurance. Um, if you need to report the incident to your insurance company, do you have an incident report form for your agency? Are they specific to a type of event or can they be used for all types of incidents as well? Make sure your staff knows how to use the forms and be sure to put copies in your disaster plans and with your supplies. Minor incidents uh, do provide us with an opportunity to test and revise our emergency procedures in a situation where the damage is uh, relatively minor. Salvage in these incidents can usually be handled in-house to restore business as usual. 
the degree of disruption of regular operations is what differentiates a minor incident or emergency from a major disaster. In a major disaster, the entire facility is impacted and regular operations are disrupted. Um, your power is likely to be out for a prolonged period of time and outside services are needed, as well as outside assistance from volunteers. And this does present a more complicated situation. And um, we should all make sure that the, our organization's volunteer, volunteers are trained on how to deal with a major disaster. And examples of a major disaster include fire, explosion, flash flood, widespread mold outbreak, or prolonged power outage. In a major disaster, an institution will have to look outside its walls for assistance. And it's likely to cause a disruption of services and operations. The focus then turns to dealing with the aftermath. You will want to eliminate hazards before going into a building and make sure that environmental health and safety officials or security officials have given you clearance to get back into your building and be on the lookout for anything that could cause hazards to cleanup crews. Make sure that your staff and audience members are accounted for. Um, it's hard to know who was in the building, especially if there are patrons, but you should have lists of staff and make sure that everyone knows where the meeting place will be following an evacuation. Um, evacuations are something that uh, should be uh, practiced regularly. Um, assemble your response team. At least the team leaders should have some training so that you can train volunteers if needed to help with a response. Establish security procedures. Um, use name badges and other means of identifying who is permitted to be on the scene. Inspect and document damage. Um, this will provide you with the information you need to make recovery decisions. Uh, as with minor incidents, uh, documenting damage is useful for insurance purposes and future education and training for disaster preparedness. Assemble and allocate needed supplies. You may not have enough supplies on hand to deal with a large disaster. Consider forming a local network with other cultural institutions or arts organizations to locate um, disaster supplies in one place. Um, you will need a, to find a way to pay for these supplies, and it's a good idea to know ahead of time where money for these supplies will come from and if there are ways to expedite the process in the event of an emergency. And we'll talk about potential supplies again at the end of this webinar. Historically, institutions have not trained or prepared staff to respond or deal with a catastrophic disaster. And examples include hurricanes, major flooding, earthquakes or tornadoes. Um, it's very difficult to prepare for what we can't imagine. Uh, and response can be coordinated more efficiently through measures such as building relationships with first responders. Performing arts organizations and other cultural institutions may not be seen as vital locations and may not be a regional priority. I encourage you to get to know the first responders in your area and um, get your institution on their radar. Characteristics of a catastrophic event, such as a lack of um, prolonged lack of communication and lack of basic services make responding extremely difficult. A lack of uh, recovery supplies and human resources do add to this difficulty. Um, communication within and externally to an organization can break down at every level. Cell towers can go down, there can be power outages, and phone lines can go down. And the immediate immediate 24 to 48 hours following a catastrophic disaster, there are steps that can be taken to make recovery easier, even though you might not have access to the area or the building. Um, response 
does require dedication and creativity. Have responders tend to safety issues first, like uh, sewage and gas leaks. Allow staff to deal with uh, personal situations. If they are worrying about the safety of their own family and homes, they will not be able to concentrate on taking care of the institution's needs. Please do encourage all staff to have a family emergency plan. Begin to contact vendors and insurance reps. Let them know as much as you know about the situation, um, even if you've not been able to inspect the facilities yourself. Um, assemble supplies. In-house supplies probably won't be enough. Uh, establish security procedures. Many people do try to take advantage of catastrophic situations. Eliminate hazards and obtain clearances. Um, do you know what steps have been taken in your state or city regarding clearances um, or identification necessary to access buildings or property? Um, when we're talking about events on this scale, we could be talking about um, terms of um, months before um, even access is uh, regained. So let's take a quick moment to see if you um, have any questions um, thus far. You can uh, ask them in the uh, chat box um, before we go on to talk about the steps in disaster planning. I know that this has been a lot of information that we're going through quickly, and we're not going to dive too deeply into um, these other specific areas today. Um, we'll just view this session as the start of a conversation about these issues. A big part of emergency and disaster planning that we will be talking about today is gathering resources from phone numbers to procedures and getting others to help. Planning strategies will vary from organization to organization uh, due to size, the type of building, the number and expertise of staff, and your financial base. In a small institution, uh, one person may carry all of the responsibility for disaster-related activities, and it may help you to get uh, someone from a neighboring institution to work with you. See, Linda has asked a question there. Since we um, perform in various public places, uh, churches, schools, etc., would you recommend us having the floor plans in hand at each performance? Um, yes, I would. I know that um, uh, before this project started, when we were um, interviewing different organizations, some touring dance organizations would say they would just show up at a venue and be handed a key and they don't know where the evacuations are, where the uh, alarm systems are, um, or any of the other uh, safety issues. Um, it was best to find out as much about um, and your host um, sites, um, emergency procedures, if they have any, or even if they don't have any. I see Susan has commented, many performing arts organizations, including um, Theirs does not have a central office. Staff and volunteers conduct work from and store digital and physical files and materials in their homes. Yes, having an inventory of who has what and where should also be parts of the plan, definitely. Yeah, I can, I can see sometimes uh, IT people just kind of panicking when they see situations like that where um, a lot of uh, vital um, information is distributed over a wide area. Um, yes, um, I'm going back to uh, dealing with a, a larger institution where more staff can be involved. Planning and preparedness may be taken on by a committee or several committees, and it's important to pre-assign recovery responsibilities, and you should think in terms of tasks and cross-train staff for all tasks. Um, define the scope of the planning process. What are you going to establish? What are you going to accomplish? Set a timetable for completion. Establish target dates for the completion of the phases of planning, such as gathering those um, vital uh, records from each of your staff and volunteers who have things stored in their homes. 
and also for collecting uh, floor plans or um, emergency procedures from uh, host institutions for uh, per, uh, touring performing groups. Um, you should identify your recovery team. Uh, these people may or may not be part of the disaster planning committee. Assess your organization's vulnerabilities by looking at what happened in past disasters. Do fact finding, considering your location, what are the weather patterns, are you near the coast? If you have a building, um, do consider things like the uh, wiring, roof, heating and ventilation, review your inspection and maintenance schedules. Um, some things to consider in establishing uh, salvage priorities are that health and human safety must be the number one priority every time. You should decide uh, which items in the building are irreplaceable items, and you should consider the uh, availability of utility services and utility workers. Um, after these decisions are made, the areas of each department or floor should be marked with the levels of prioritization. And remember that this is not an item by item prioritization, but by area or type of material. And once your uh, priorities have been outlined, they should be reviewed once a year or whenever your mission changes when you add new services, uh, when a new department is added, um, when there are renovations, and be sure to update the floor plans and the prioritization uh, for your recovery list. And the next step in disaster planning is determining key functions. I wanna focus on your uh, business resumption plan or continuity of operations plan. A business continuity plan basically identifies essential services and what needs to happen in order for your institution to continue operating at minimum levels and meeting your patrons basic needs. And some people um, have separate uh, business continuity plans and others do incorporate them into their disaster plan. And next, um, what do you need to ensure that those uh, functions are back up and running? Do you need um, electricity or uh, drinkable water? Could uh, you do some um, services uh, remotely? Um, once you've gathered information, you need to sort information in a way that makes sense to you. Plan for small, large, and wide area disasters. You can have a meeting and ask uh, questions like, what if uh, this disaster affects a room, an entire floor, an off-site facility, the whole building, or an entire city or block. Um, and you can also sort by specific types of disasters, such as a fire, flood, hurricane, tornado, or earthquake. And make a list of um, pre-disaster actions to follow in the case of an emergency for which there is advanced knowledge, such as a hurricane where you might be able to board up windows and call vendors to alert them to a potential need for assistance after the storm passes. Okay, so let's move on to step six, developing resource lists. And this may be one of the most important slides in this whole presentation. Your communications plan should include your staff phone tree and I hope all of your organizations do have a staff phone tree. And it should also include um, who to call if you're on a campus or in a government agency, um, a list of your local city, state, FEMA, uh, emergency management agencies, a list of recovery team members with their work and home numbers, um, names of consultants and recovery companies, and lists of any contracts with the vendors. Also, make sure you know who has the authority to call a disaster recovery vendor. Um, chances are this um, may not be the head of the disaster team um, who does have the authority to ask a vendor to come to your site. Um, finding out this information ahead of time will save you um, headaches during a disaster. 
um, for all of this contact information, you're going to want to provide day and night time and weekend contact information. You're also going to want email and alternative uh, emails in case your institutional email is down. And be thinking about alternative means of uh, communication like uh, satellite phones or group email distribution lists. In an emergency, traditional means of communication may not be working, so you will need to be creative. And a couple of slides back, I spoke about uh, building relationships with first responders. And this is a critical component to the successful recovery uh, from a disaster. All disasters are local. And make contacts with your local fire marshal and police chief. This could include campus or corporate police and fire. Um, invite them to tour your building um, if you have a building and give them a copy of your emergency plan and ask if they provide training. Um, often they are happy to provide free uh, fire extinguisher training or even some basic training in first aid. Um, local emergency managers um, are valuable allies because they know about the hazards specific to a region. They know the local emergency protocols, local resources for training, and you can help them by pointing out um, any hidden hazards in your facility. Um, open a dialogue with uh, county and state emergency management officials. Uh, tell them how you could uh, help other arts and cultural organizations and the general public in the event of an, emergent, an area emergency. Find out what sort of uh, training they recommend and offer. Um, make sure they understand your needs in an emergency. The state level emergency management agency is responsible for coordinating and providing resources to local governments in the event of an emergency. And they run the state emergency operations command center where activities are coordinated. FEMA has 10 regional offices around the country and uh, find out which uh, FEMA region you're in and make contacts with those um, representatives. And we will talk about FEMA uh, more in uh, just a moment. Continuing on with developing uh, resource lists, do an inventory of in-house supplies. Uh, you may not have the money or desire to keep everything on hand, but it is a good idea to know where to go um, if you need to purchase additional supplies and how you can pay for them. In a major disaster, banks may not be working. See if you can cut through some of the traditional red tape in an emergency to get the needed supplies quickly. Doing this before a disaster strikes is essential. Once you've done that, create a list of things to purchase, where to buy them, and how you can do it in a way that minimizes the red tape that you will have to go through. Um, other important documentation to gather um, includes um, locations of keys and door codes. Know where to find floor plans with important information like utility shutoff valves. And you may want to keep this part of the plan limited to a few key personnel and emergency services people. Understanding your financial abilities and constraints is vital to understanding your options in dealing with a disaster. Um, questions you need to know in advance include, how much money is available? If the answer is none, then that's important to know in advance. Um, what can the money be used for? Who can authorize payments? Um, we talked about this a few slides ago. You need to know who can authorize payments and it may not be you. Um, that means you need to be able to um, explain to the, to the decision maker why you need the money and for what. Are there emergency funds? How much funding is available? Um, in addition to insurance, uh, your institution needs to have contingency funds. Money should be set aside in advance to cover expenses until the insurance kicks in. Beware of any accounting procedures involved. Um, can they be simplified in the event of an emergency?
In some cases, your insurance, your insurance company may make decisions about how and what to recover. Um, it's important to know what kind of insurance you have and what it covers. Um, do you have specialized policies such as event cancelization, cancellation or um, business interruption insurance? Talk with your insurance companies ahead of disasters. Um, get to know your agent. Ask them to go through your building if you have one and talk about ways to reduce risks. It might even save you money. Um, even if you can't afford sprinklers, your insurance rates might go down if you can prove to the insurance company that you're taking other measures to mitigate disasters, um, such as security and disaster recovery drills. Your state and local emergency management groups work with FEMA to distribute money to uh, affected locales. And it's important to know that FEMA is not there instead of insurance, but as a supplement. You must go through your insurance companies first. Additional funding can come from a variety of sources, but rarely is it enough to meet all of your needs. The government can provide loans after a disaster through the Small Business Administration and through the NEH or the NEA. All of these groups will have different requirements for the distribution of funding. Um, all require documentation of some sort, so make sure you document as much as you can in the event of a disaster. As private uh, nonprofits, uh, most performing arts organizations are eligible for federal aid if a federal disaster declaration is made. You can apply for funds beyond what is uh, covered by regular insurance. FEMA is not a replacement for insurance and you must know the rules ahead of time. FEMA gives reimbursement only for what insurance won't cover. So you must go through your insurance first. There's money for stabilization, debris removal, and emergency protective uh, measures. And to be part of a uh, declared disaster area, the president must declare it. If you're outside those designated counties, you will not get any money. So let's talk about compiling your disaster plan. It's going to be easier to take a phased approach and tackle it in sections. For example, update the phone list and then move on to your next task. Make sure that you are setting uh, realistic goals. Um, this can empower you rather than discourage you. A timeline is important, but um, do make sure that you're giving yourself plenty of time. Um, make sure that your plan is clear and reliable. A detailed plan does not need to be long. Um, it should be concise but thorough. You should review it at least annually, especially the contacts and uh, phone number sections. A good way to do this is to review it every year on May Day. Um, work together with uh, your colleagues on this. It's important to not be in a vacuum, and we will talk more about that in a moment. Do take advantage of any regional or national resources. So I know that um, this is a lot to cover, but we are on the home stretch. Um, if you do have any additional um, questions or comments at this point, um, please do put them in the chat box. But I'm going to talk um, a lot about uh, information uh, resources that are available to you. Um, and this is uh, something really quick to show you. Um, this is a risk assessment checklist from preparemybusiness.org. Um, there will be a link to this in the resource handout that you will receive. The checklist guides the user through identifying and rating risks on a scale of one to five. The probability and impact are multiplying to determine the importance of a risk. And this is a good example of a very simple assessment tool. Um, this flowchart resource is from ready.gov and is helpful about thinking about the steps of continuity planning. Um, Susan asks, do you have any 
business continuity plans that are tailored for decentralized organizations. Um, I believe that they're maybe on our website, a sample of one. I know the uh, there's one for the um, city of Las Vegas. It's very different from a uh, continuity plan for a single organization. That might help with uh, looking at um, decentralized organizations. Um, there's also um, at least one um, straightforward emergency plan for a, an organization that uh, does not have um, its own building. I believe that their um, emergency plan dealt with their um, annual meetings that would be in uh, hotels around the country. So they had to figure out how to write a plan for dealing with different environments for um, every time they got together. And that is on our downloadable on our website as well. And uh, and this uh, graphic here, the uh, steps in the flow chart are um, business impact analysis, recovery strategies, plan development, and testing. And again, the um, PDF of the slides you will receive has the link uh, to this um, brief resource. And this is a good list from Arts Ready, the um, top 10 things you can do now to be more prepared for a disruption for your work. Um, and it has simple suggestions like um, using an old fashioned credit card slide and carbon paper, um, keep one or more in your box office or accounting department. Um, and also if you do have facilities, um, keep an up to date 360 view of your facilities and pictures or video. And that's good documentation for the insurance company. And I won't go through the um, whole list there, but um, I encourage you to look through it um, because you can see that there are some simple steps that you can take that uh, will have a large impact. And let's talk uh, very briefly about networks. The Alliance for Response is a great example and is led by the Foundation for Advancement in Conservation. And it links uh, cultural heritage and emergency response representatives. And it leads to new partnerships and local projects. And the aim of the Alliance is to foster cooperation among emergency managers, um, cultural and arts organizations, um, influence uh, local planning efforts, and enhance the protection of cultural, artistic, and historic resources. And more than 800 institutions have uh, participated in the Alliance in uh, 30 regions. And the Alliance um, has started to work, uh, has started to network with uh, performing arts organizations in recent years. And through an initiative, such as this, uh, resources um, such as money, supplies, and infrastructure systems can be shared. And I know that there um, used to be an Alliance for Response chapter in uh, Central Virginia, but I don't know if they are active or if there is currently one in Virginia, but um, I encourage you to um, find out. And I've listed um, some examples of how uh, networks like these are helping all institutions involved. There are many more examples and the you know, list of networks is uh, growing uh, today. And um, for example, on this slide, the um, Atlanta group established a local listserv that includes emergency responders and they can share information and resources ask questions and participate in a first responder uh, training through the listserv. And Boston was awarded a hazard mitigation grant from FEMA to provide training at the community level. And with all of these, though there may not be a lot of funding out there, there are ways to work together collaboratively to, do, to uh, share some of the burden. And I encourage you to do so. And um, since um, all of you are located um, in Virginia, you know, fairly close to one another, um, you're at um, a great advantage to um, turn to each other as a resource um, and, as, and work with Arts Fairfax. 
And I'm going to talk very briefly here about disaster supplies. Um, part of your disaster supplies um, should include templates like uh, inventory control lists and assessment forms. And you will need other materials, especially for salvage, but it's hard to estimate your needs until you have a disaster. Um, there are some recommended supplies lists which can be found on the Lyricist website, so that might be a good place to get started. You should aim to have enough supplies to last for the first 24 hours of a larger disaster until more supplies can be shipped or enough to fully take care of yourself um, in a small disaster. And it's best to have um, designated disaster supplies, but some things not designated will need to be used in non-disaster times as well, like a, a wet dry bag. And some things may need to be supplied by a vendor under contract with your, with your institution, such as generators. And on this slide here, we see that there are also ready-made disaster supply kits, such as a rest cube, which is available from university products and contains um, basics like a mop bucket, uh, sponges, and plastic sheeting. It is cheaper to uh, buy everything individually, but it's certainly easier to buy them in a cube. And it is important that everyone in your organization understand that those supplies are only to be used in an emergency. And um, has anyone um, here today um, participated in CERT training? That's the uh, Community Emergency Response Team Training. Um, um, this is a national program that's um, offered by FEMA that educates volunteers about disaster preparedness for hazards that impact their area and trains them in basic disaster response skills like fire safety, search and rescue, team organization, and uh, disaster medical operations. The uh, link on this slide takes you to the site where you can sign up or search for your local team. And if you want more in-depth training, FEMA offers training through the Emergency Management Institute. And this slide has a link to the online courses they offer. And it introduces the National Response Framework, National Incident Management System, and National Preparedness Guidelines. And the PAR project um, and our partners at South Arts and NEDCC, the uh, Northeast Documents Conservation Center, have just launched the DPLAN Arts Ready online planning tool that assists users in collecting and compiling data for their institution's emergency plan. And a number of uh, free one-year subscriptions are available to um, arts organizations. And the link on this slide leads to an application form for the free uh, subscriptions. And my colleague on the project, Janet Newcomb, and I will be presenting a webinar about this for um, Arts Fairfax on July 28th. And I hope you will join us for that. And these are some other great uh, online resources you should be aware of. Um, there's the Americans for the Arts uh, Disaster Preparedness page that contains information about preparedness and response. Um, next is the um, Craft Emergency Relief Fund. Um, SURF uh, provides uh, readiness and relief resources for studio artists. And much of the content is useful for the performing arts community as well. Next is Fractured Atlas, and that helps artists with um, business resources such as insurance, fundraising, and training. And I see Lisa says D Plan is awesome. That's great. And and uh, D Plan, um, uh, the original D Plan was um, revised and combined with uh, South Arts as uh, Arts Ready to uh, form the a new plan that we have now. Um, and here are some other resources that will assist you in creating a disaster plan. In um, 
response for uh, sample emergency plans from performing arts organizations. Um, as I've already mentioned, the PAR project has made a few for a few available for download from our website. Um, please do take a look at these plans. Um, they were all created as part of our emergency planning grant program. And while none of them will be a perfect match for your organization, you should feel free to uh, adapt these models to your organization's needs. So I believe that there are one or two that deal with a decentralized organization um, that does not have its own facility. And um, even for those that um, cover an organization that has a facility, elements of their plan uh, or the structure of their plan uh, would be useful to um, say even a touring organization that doesn't have a home building. The Getty link uh, on the slide is a guide for building an emergency plan for cultural institutions, but much of it can be adapted uh, for performing arts organizations. And here are some uh, other links to emergency service vendors. Uh, the American Institute for Conservation website's uh, Find a Conservator service will allow you to search by zip code and type of conservation. The National Heritage Responders Team are for later assessment and recovery. And there are national response companies like Belfer out there that will do just about all recovery services as well. Um, it's great to establish relationships with companies like this ahead of time to find out what they will do and how they'll do it. And the mold testing lab, they're listed uh, M Lab is a big national company, but you might also want to find someone locally. And I think um, perhaps M Lab has changed their name recently. I'll need to check on that. Um, and here I've listed a few resources that um, address the reopening of venues during COVID that were really important over the past year. There's the Event Safety Alliance's uh, reopening guide, the COVID-19 handbook for the creative sector, and Navigating Uncertain Times, which is a scenario planning toolkit from the Wallace Foundation that is great. And these all have different approaches and focuses. So it can be good to be acquainted with uh, several to address your organization's needs. And our project partner, the Houston Arts Alliance, has created a series of short videos that address disaster resilience for artists and nonprofit performing arts organization. And this is a fabulous new resource. The link is there on the slide and will be in the handout that you receive. And the videos are um, brief, I think mostly around five minutes and are on YouTube. So if you just want a real quick um, chunk of information about these different topics, um, those videos are great resources. And in response to uh, requests for case studies of performing arts organizations responses to emergencies, we've included several on our website under the case studies tab. Um, the emergencies have included uh, hurricanes, the death of an organization's founder, and the need for virtualization. And these stories can be models for your consideration of how to respond to emergencies. And I've included um, this list of uh, webinars offered by PAR um, here at the end of our session so that the significance of topics such as uh, risk assessment, networking, and understanding cybersecurity would be clearer. And all of these are listed on the PAR website under the events tab, and recordings are available for most of these. Okay, so um, we talked about emergency management, the uh, components of a disaster plan, business continuity, types of incidents and disasters, and resources. And does um, anyone have any um, 
additional questions at this point. So I know this was uh, quite a bit of information that we covered uh, quickly. So the uh, webinars that I listed um, earlier are much deeper dives um, into each of these topics, and I, I do highly recommend them. And listed on this slide are the um, Twitter and Facebook accounts for the PAR project and my con my uh, contact information. Um, do uh, contact me with any information if you are looking for uh, specific examples of things like um, something for a decentralized organization. Um, send a question my way. And I want to um, thank you all for um, participating today. And I think I will turn this over now um, to um, Hope. Thank you so much, Steve. That was very informative. It was really nice to see things that I know that we're doing. And um, uh, you gave some really great resources and I can't wait to bring this back to our team. Um, and thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Um, please keep in mind that the next session is on the 28th. Um, if you haven't already signed up for it, please go ahead. Um, I think all of you have though, so. Thanks. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please let us know. And as Steve said, um, I will be sending out the slides and also the resource list um, right after this concludes. So if anyone has any questions, if anyone doesn't have any questions, then we will conclude. Thank you so much for joining. And remember to get in your project support grant applications, your final reports, and also help us spread the word about the Poet Laureate. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much for, for hosting this uh, webinar. <laughs>